Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you for joining us for this UPS webinar on how to rocket returns. I'm Sean Flaherty and with me is our returns frontman Jim Brill. We're going to spend the next hour uh, more or less talking to you about the latest thinking in returns and uh, things you can do to be more successful. Jim, you want to set the stage for us? Sure thing, uh, Sean. I appreciate it. Glad to be with everybody today. And just want to let everybody know that this webinar is to help bring awareness to uh, reverse logistics and returns. And as everybody probably is aware, we just finished peak season. And with that, we're also in the middle of concluding peak return season as well. Returns are an outcome of all that shipping going on out there. And, and so with record shipping comes record setting returns as well as uh, not only the shipments, but also the walk-in returns out there. So we just got through the, the remainder of the season here and we're counting it up and you know, we're setting records once again for returns. Now obviously the impact is coming from those highlight shopping days, advances in coupons and promotions that we see not necessarily on that shopping day, but maybe two, three weeks even beforehand. And also uh, the culmination of the holiday gift giving season. And I, Sean, I got to think that uh, e-commerce may have had something to do with that. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get into all those details uh, about uh, you know the different things that are driving the growth and returns in just a couple minutes. But uh, really, for uh, for returns, it's about making it easier for the consumers, right? It's all about uh, all about those returns. Absolutely. Um, there's a there's a lot of things happening, uh, and and we actually highlight the peak of returns with National Returns Day. So that happened here Janu January 2nd. I want to say we, uh, we exceeded our expectations once again. Yeah. So why are, we, why are we seeing such high returns numbers, Jim? What's, what's that all about? That's a great question. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different phenomena out there that's driving the escalation of returns. Uh, so I'll go through a couple of those right now. So obviously I, I touched on it, but uh, those, those shopping days, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, Small Business Saturday. There's there's all these spotlight shipping days that's really pushing and promoting e-commerce shopping, e-commerce gift buying, and uh, a lot of that is really escalating not only uh, the shopping phenomenon, get, get out of the brick and mortar stores and buy online, but with that comes some additional phenomena of, of when you get a shipment delivered to your home. Uh, we see chart topping growth in e-commerce. That's that's obviously another outcome, and you know a little bit about that too, Sean. Yeah. You? So the overall growth in e-commerce is is upwards of 24% annually, kind of globally, close to a three trillion dollar market. Uh, these and some other things we're going to talk about in the course of today's discussion are, are outcomes from our UPS Pulse, the online shopper survey that we do uh, every couple of years, and uh, the overall growth in the industry. Of course, you know, a common title lifts all boats, but as you have growth in e-commerce, you have growth in the need to return products that for whatever reason the consumer wasn't satisfied with or they didn't fit or, uh, you know, something occurred. And we'll talk about the different drivers of returns so we can go further in here. Awesome point. Um, here's another phenomenon that's happening because of e-commerce shopping. You're basically trusting the image online on, on your computer screen or your, your mobile phone. And then when you get that delivery, <clears throat> then you're, you're basically treating your living room as the new dressing room. You can't do that uh, with a shipment, but you have to wait till it gets delivered. And so if we, uh, we look at the image of our, our model here, she's, her persona is uh, women's fashions, in this case shoes. And if I count them up there, it looks like she has four different pairs of shoes <laughs> that she's trying on. So she's ordered all these shoes. She, that could be my house. It could be. And do you like black high heels? Uh, for my wife. Oh, okay. Well, she's... She's a value shopper. She's assessing the fit, maybe the finish. Does it go with the wardrobe? She planned to wear it out. So that persona is growing and growing where people are doing more and more shopping. They keep the ones that they, um, they want to, uh, to keep, obviously, and they're going to return the ones that, uh, that don't fit or that doesn't go with, with uh, whatever they're trying to do. You know, the other point that's here is this idea of subscription models where people are just receiving goods on a routine basis, you know, whether it's, it's monthly or, or, or periodically, that come to you. And, it, you know, it kind of reminds me to go with our theme here. You remember the old Columbia Records Club in the old days where they'd send you 10 free CD? Did I just say CDs? I'm dating myself. Right? I was going to say two cassettes, Prom Night 78. Yeah, 10 free records to start with, but then every month they send you two more. 
and you have to pay for them or you have to send them back. And I don't know that anybody in the old days ever sent anything back, and I think that was how they, they made the money to give you the 10 free ones up front. So these subscription models have the same kind of challenge. You know, they send you those goods. The consumer is going to want to get the things that they aren't going to keep out of the subscription model back to the retailer, right? That, that's right. It, it's, a, it's a business model that's emerged here in the last uh, couple, two, three years. And with it comes a built-in returns process. They're going to read your profile, your, your, your uh, description of what you like, and then they assemble a monthly subscription box. And if we pick on apparel, it's going to be pants, belt, shirt, shoes. And they already know that uh, you know, they would love for you to keep 100% of it, but they, they build into that business model the fact that they know some of it, most of it, maybe all of it is coming back. So we see a rise in returns because of that business model emerging. But not all retailers have that model. So let's talk about some other phenomena. Well, the next one up is uh, something that's been around for a little while, but the, the phenomena of using uh, online e-commerce shopping for shoes a lot of consumers are out there. They may not know, particularly <clears throat> from one brand to the next, how they size their shoes, as an example. So, well, maybe it's a, maybe I'm a nine, maybe I'm a nine and a half, maybe I'm a ten. So they'll go ahead and order all three, receive the shipments, and again, back to using your living room as the dressing room, they'll try on all three, keep the one that fits, and send back the other two. So is the idea here to to to, to get the to, to get the one you need or to find the one you want? Well, kind of both. Uh, so maybe Mick Jagger wasn't right. You, you, maybe you can always get what you want now? I think with, with e-commerce shopping, you can usually get what you want. You but just have to be able to return what you have. Exactly. It creates, a, it creates a problem or a challenge for the, for the retailer. Well, and our, our, our point in bringing up, bringing up these causes of returns is so merchants know that these are some of the things that are going on and that, that consumers are employing to make sure they do get what they want and to know that returns is an outcome of e-commerce shopping. So living room is a new dressing room, bracketing, and subscription models. Now here, here comes another one, rental models. So we see this happening certainly in women's fashions, women's accessories, where maybe that designer dress is really way out of, way out of sight in terms of the price, but we have several companies that do rental situations for maybe that, that beautiful evening dress. Uh, you're going to the, the ball, you're going to the gala event, and you need a very nice dress, but you don't want to spend the money, so they will rent you that hot top-end fashion, the top-end name. You go ahead and wear it and then return it. So we see this with not only uh, women's fashions and accessories. I've seen a company that does it with toys, so you can rent the toy. Well, kids age out of toys really quickly these days. Yeah, and so then when you're done, you return them, and then they, they process them and get them on to the next. And then I was reading an article the other day that actually said uh, right behind this is going to be men's fashion. Men's fashion? How's that going to work? Well, do you have a tuxedo hanging in your closet, Sean? Uh, I, I do. When's the last time you wore it? I'm going to go with uh, 2012, probably. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm saying I... I've had one hanging in my closet for 10 years and worn it once. So yeah. they're going to fit that, that need, which is, I don't need to buy one, I'll just rent it. That probably would have been the smarter choice. Yeah. Now, for the past five, six years, the UPS has done a really nice job, I believe, in bringing to bear the need for merchants and e-commerce retailers to to really be cognizant of what, what's going on with the consumer. We, we've certainly gather a lot of information through the Pulse of the Online Shopper studies that we've done. And here, as, as, uh, as we know, you better have an easy to understand returns policy and process. And that's obviously in the eye of the beholder, you the merchant. But is there, your policy easy to locate? Is it easy to read and understand? Or is it bathed in a lot of legalese? Yeah, that was one of our big findings from the 2019 Pulse was, was really that Consumers increasingly want transparency in the entire retail transaction, but we actually saw, and we'll talk more about the details, 54% of our surveyed respondents indicated that they check the returns policy before they actually execute the transaction. So if, they, if that, you said it in the eye of the beholder, but if that policy isn't accommodating enough, that can actually be a barrier to sale. Right. So when, you, when your consumer, your shopper, visits your site, are they met with um, kind of a lot of friction? Is, it, is your policy worded on behalf of you, the merchant, or is it worded nicely so that it benefits 
them? Is there a nice long return period or is it a very short period? So they're going to go there and they want to know if it's going to be, um, you know, a hit or are we going to have a flop? So, so be cognizant that the, the returns policy as well as the process is playing a key role in that consumer's um, path to purchase, as we call it. And then finally, uh, social media and consumer satisfaction is also a, a, a driver, a concern, obviously. Uh, with things like the, the star rating system, do you, do you have a process and a policy set up where they're going to give you all five stars or you're going to get one star? Uh, they do have the power of um, mobile and the comment section and the ability to tweet and do all these things. Are they going to provide you positive comments or, you know, give you a high net promoter score. Yeah, I think the social media point is one we, we can't hit hard enough. You know, we in Pulse, we saw that 90% of consumers said that they would stop or decrease their spending if they had a bad experience. Um, but on top of that, if they had a bad experience, 35%, 33% said they would file an official complaint, right? That's kind of the routine. But another 35% said they wouldn't. They just go straight to social media. And we've seen that, you know, that can be a barrier to sales as well because over 30% of consumers also reported that they go out and check the reviews of a, of a merchant before they make a purchase. And if there's a lot of bad press out there about the returns process, then that's going to that's gonna slow down, you know, the, the sales process. So right. And, and we see that in the Pulse of the Online Shopper feedback. And we just want to make sure that you're aware that that does happen. If you didn't, you probably already did. But uh, we want you to have a top 40 chart buster out there and be a rock star. So I think that brings us to our, our first poll. We're going to poll the audience here from time to time. So we want to see, uh, we're going to talk about what the top types of uh, returned items are, but uh, we're going to see if the poll here can guess what they are. So your, your options, and you can choose three, are electronics, apparel, toys, beanbag chairs, personal favorite of mine, guitar picks, shoes, drumsticks, unicycles, accessories, and uh, apparently do-it-yourself tattoo kits. So I will tell you that the, the – uh, wow. I've got two drummers in my house, so if my wife and I could return the drum tricks, that would be, a, that would be a, a big, big win for us. Um, while, we're, while we're seeing the poll fill out here, uh, let's uh, share with you my favorite returns uh, story because it happens to be on this slide. So we've got uh, – I purchased a beanbag chair online and had it shipped to a US UPS access point, Jim. When I got that thing home, it was like a 24 by 24 by 36 box. And uh, as soon as I cut the packing straps off of it, uh, that box started to expand. It was uh, almost like a Christina Aguilera song. I was kind of with the genie out of the bottle there. Oh, look at this. So uh, hold down for me a little bit there, Jim. And so we've got 82% say apparel, beanbag chairs, uh, not not scoring highly. <laughs> Probably the right choice, shoes, right? And uh, what did unicycles? I would have thought. Uh, I, I feel like uh, some people have tapped into kind of our inner energy and are having <laughs> a little fun with the survey today. So, so yeah, that's right. The, the three biggest ones are are definitely um, apparel. Uh, shoes and accessories. Those, yeah. are the, those are the big return items. Probably not a surprise there. I'm surprised at the tattoo kits. I thought that was going to be bigger for rock stars. You know? I, I think you can only take a theme so far before it wears thin. So um, we'll move on. I'm going to date myself yet again with, a, with another uh, reference if you want to keep going here. Um, so why are people returning things? So I got that the instinct reference of bye 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 here. But uh, let's talk about why consumers are returning things. And, and based on uh, the options Jim was talking about earlier, right, it seems like consumers have a lot of reasons to, to return things, but when we surveyed them with the Pulse, we didn't really hear consumers taking responsibility for the returns process. If you look at the top three here, there are really things that look like they're merchant controllable, right? So faulty or, or damaged goods, the goods aren't as described, poor quality, so really things that a, that a savvy merchant can probably manage uh, on their side. And in the reverse logistics world, that is uh, the mainstay of why products get returned. It's usually a merchant, a shipper, cited issue or, or cause or reason. Yeah. Well, I think but, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, ignore the bottom either. Now, obviously, ordering more than one gets back to your bracketing issues with delivery. That's something that hopefully you know we are helping with or can help with, or just this consumer didn't want the item. So. 
you know, the top one you're being faulty or damaged, that and faulty could even it may not be that it's that the product didn't work. It could be that the product the wrong product was fulfilled. Or or when it arrived it, it wasn't what they thought they were getting, as not as described, could be the pictures on the website weren't as revealing as maybe they needed to be to fully disclose what, what the, the consumer was purchasing. So important factors to consider. And obviously, you know, as we get deeper into this, consumers clearly they know what they want. Uh, and and they feel like a lot of the challenges and friction in this process may belong to someone else. So moving on to the next one, consumers really 73% here are saying that the returns experience impacts their future choice. Are they going to continue to use that retailer to purchase things? So uh, we've mentioned this a couple times, but your returns process isn't just about that transaction. It's about future transactions as well. And then nearly 70% said that they were uh, less likely to purchase from a retailer if they had to pay for returns, right? So, uh, you know, we know free shipping is a very powerful force in the retail space today. Uh, free returns appears to be becoming an expectation as well. And then finally, I made this point earlier on in, in your comments, Jim, that 54% said they go and they look at that returns policy prior to making the purchase and then executing a transaction. Right. So all important factors to think about, right, that, that, that your returns process affects your future sales, that people want the returns process to be free, and they're going to go check and see what the process really looks like. Well, in the world of e-commerce shopping, customer satisfaction is high on the list. So. I, I think it's number one on the list, right? Um, so what are shoppers looking for in the returns experience? Um, well, here again, they told us in the Pulse Online Shopper Survey, and you know, free returns was number one at 42%, almost 15% higher than everything else, right? And uh, items two through four are really about you know, making it easy for the consumer, right? So they want it to be hassle-free. They want an automatic refund. Uh, they want an easy-to-print return label. Uh, they want an easy-to-follow return procedure. And I really think if you think about the way the, the forward movements in the, the supply chain have worked in e-commerce, the easier those have become, the more successful retailers have become. And so I think the returns process is widely viewed as the point of greatest friction. Uh, and if we can start to reduce that friction, I think that that will actually help pick, uh, pick the growth companies going forward. Yeah, and for merchants, you know, it is a balancing act. You need to make sure that your consumers are, are taken care of and happy, but at the same time, you have to you know, make sure you're not making it so easy and so, so, so friction-free that you know, it's impacting the bottom line. So it is a balancing act of some sort. Sure, sure. You want to have skin in the game, right? Right, right. Absolutely. So that brings us to our second poll, I think, um, and this is really about, you know, we, we talked about peak, and we all know about Black Friday and Cyber Monday and increasingly small business Saturday, right, those, those days that everybody thinks about leading up to the December holiday season, but, but really, uh, we have some mini peaks throughout the year that people might not be aware of, so we're, we're going to invite you to try and choose three occasions here that you think might drive a, a mini peak for return, so that the options are really Fourth of July, Groundhog Day. Mother's Day, Father's Day, Jimi Hendrix's birthday, three weeks after Prime Day, Valentine's Day, Labor Day, and the start of the end of the school semester. So I thought Bon Jovi would have made the list. Yeah, not so much. I, uh, but let me ask you this. Your name is Jim. Yeah. Jim, do you know when Jimi Hendrix's birthday is? Well, for certain people, it's every day. <laughs> but no, I do not know. <laughs> well, I, I, I have Google. So I, I looked this up for you, and it's actually November 27th, which interestingly enough might be a little bit of a red herring because November 27th could be Black Friday or Cyber Monday, depending on when the Thanksgiving holiday falls in a given year. So, Very interesting. Yeah. All right, let's see Fun how right, let's, let's see, see how we're doing. Let's see how the polls going here. So there's our choices, and here's how we're coming along. All right, so a little bit of Fourth of July. Fourth of July. Why would Fourth of July be? And there's a lot of uh, fireworks, returning fire. Yeah, I think grills and probably the yeah, Mother's Day, fifty eight packs, and a lot of Mother's Day gifts. Unfortunately, may have to come back. Oh, I, I yeah, that's Father's that's Day. happened in my house. Father's Day, not so much. Jimi Hendrix, uh, not high on the list. Now, sorry to say. Uh, Three weeks after Prime Day, yeah, that is uh, that is a factor. Valentine's Day, oh, another heartbreaker there. Uh, Tom Petty would be upset with that, but uh, uh, Valentine's Day, unfortunately, gifts are given and some have to go back. Yeah. Uh, Labor Day, and then surprisingly, start and end of school semester. 
Interesting. That's a big one, isn't it? That is a big one. Truly, of the list, that is one of them, and that would be related to the startup and the end of the school semester but and the that book rentals. Book, book rentals is not getting yeah. closed. No. Well, probably some of that as well. But, uh, the many peaks are fueled by many things. So, very interesting. Good, good results. Here's our, uh, here's our actual list. Make sure I get the slide up there. So, Fourth of July, Mother's Day, starting out of school, semester, Prime Day, and Valentine's Day. So, yeah, yeah, those are many peaks that we see throughout the year for return. So, if you weren't aware of that, merchants, um, you do need to, you know, be aware that uh, maybe your your returns are spiking during those peaks as well. Okay, moving along here. <clears throat> so. Coming out of our peak return season, and with National Return Day reaching all new heights, we have a question for you merchants out there. Is your returns process top of the charts, or are you getting a lot of static, a lot of feedback out there? A great returns experience turns your customers, your consumers, your shoppers into super fans. And we've, we've been around a lot of folks doing this, and we, we do have the, the, uh, the, the best top of the charts, elements as well as those that receive a lot of static. So top elements of a great returns experience include the things you see on the list there. Proactive communications, flexible return options, simplicity and transparency. That's really about making it easy, right? Not taking making it, easy, it easy. making it easy. Yeah. From uh, merchants that are having a lot of problems with it and receiving a lot of static, so to speak, or struggling, you require your consumer to call in and get authorization to make a return. You have a complex policy on your website. You have a short return period. It's been proven that if you do stretch out the returns period a little bit, you give them a little more time, they're more apt to, do you know the answer? Keep it, keep the item. Yeah, makes sense. People think they, think they got a little more time, a little more time, a little more time, and next thing you know, a month has yeah. gone by and they never actually send it back. If you put a seven day return policy on it, they, they panic and they, they make a snap decision, usually they're gonna return it. So, uh, do you charge with stocking fee? Do you delay the refund? Do you charge them credit charges? And do you have no lack of visibility? So, so they want to see us moving backwards in the, in, in the supply chain so that they can say, oh, yeah, they've received my return. I should be getting my money back, right? That's what's driving it. At the end of the day, it's all about the refund. So okay. they want to have transparency into the process as well as the status of the refund. So our goal here with this webinar is obviously to help retailers and e-commerce merchants across the board optimize your reverse logistics process and know what your options are. Uh, it involves obviously a lot more than just returns. You know, UPS is very good at moving packages all across the globe, obviously. But we want to help you with returns management, maybe even a little bit about returns prevention. And then in the middle are things what are affectionately known as triage, but how, how do you recover things? What do you do with it when you get it back to your warehouse? So really about optimizing the revenue that they can eventually get on right. that on that uh, on that uh, product. Well, it's, it's not only that, but it's also minimizing the cost to do these things. Ah, okay. Uh, make it streamlined, make it efficient, and then once you have it back and you figure out what you got back, what do we what do we have to do to the items? Do we have to refurbish it? Do we have to repair it? Do we have to repackage it? Uh, is it in such bad shape that we need to just call it what it is and throw it away, or can we donate? There's a lot of different outcomes. And UPS has uh, some tools that we can help you with in, in determining what that final step is, the disposition or the outcome of the goods. So um, I'm, I'm, that's really quite a complex process, Jim. I'm guessing we might have some uh, ways that we're going to help out. Well, it's funny you should ask. Like a true rock star, yeah. Uh, UPS has a returns portfolio of capabilities, so I'd like to just briefly run through those with okay. everybody. Hey, you skipped right over that three components of a UPS returns piece. Oh, I, we're I, I wanted to bring that up because that really resonated with me. It reminded me of, of the police with the three-piece band, you know, oh, the oh. guitar, drums, and then sting on the bass and vocals. There you so, go. All right. I like what you did there. That was pretty good, uh, being a drummer myself. I'm, I'm a big fan of the police. So with that, the three components of our returns rock band here would be the services aspect. So we have a variety of return capabilities from a labels perspective. In the middle, we have the ability to have the UPS driver come out and collect the return and bring the label and put it on and take it away. 
We also have some premium offerings uh, like returns exchange, for instance, where the, you can ship out a replacement and the driver will execute a unpack and a repack. So we'll deliver the replacement goods and collect the defective goods. So a pretty broad portfolio of services. Supporting that is also, this would be the guitar player, the technology section of returns, which we have a variety of platforms that you as a merchant, no matter what your size, you can select from to to uh, make your return process easy. So we have UPS Returns Manager, which is a portal that anybody can sign up for and, and execute your returns process very easily, and your consumer just has to track their package. Hit the button that says Return This Package, and then they're presented with their return options. We certainly have APIs and shipping systems that, uh, that our customers that use UPS have access to. And then we also have a variety of UPS-ready vendors out there that have a ton of different shipping platforms. A few of them have return platforms that you can employ to, again, execute your returns program. And then returns wouldn't be uh, complete. Your rock band wouldn't be complete without a space player, which is you have to make it also easy and efficient, not only for you, the merchant, but also for your consumer, your customer. And that's where our base player, our convenient access points, really come into play with helping the consumer get their return into the, uh, the network very quickly. So here we have a variety of drop boxes. We have the UPS store network. You can actually hand your return directly to a driver. We have our alliance partners such as CVS, Advance Auto, Michael. uh, Michaels, as another example, and then we have our huge access point network out there for pickup and drop off. Yeah, and we're continuing to expand that access point network, so uh, there'll be more and more options available in the future. Um, so the three, the three, the three components you were talking about are really services, our technology platforms, and then the convenient access. Really, to kind of put a bow on it. Right on. Right on. And our goal here is to uh, to make UPS part of your reverse logistics band. So with that, we, we feel that we have the best chance, the best tools, the best people to come out and work with you to uh, help you with your uh, the reliability and using our comprehensive portfolio to help you with efficiency, impact your bottom line. Obviously, we talked a lot about the impact of the consumer's experience. And right on down the line here, um, we, we feel we can help you out. So. With that, we have one gigantic question here right at the end, which is, do you want to ask it or should I? No, go ahead. Are you ready to rock returns in 2020? Uh, no, it's not the same without the kind of heavy metal tree, right? But, well, we were going to have pyrotechnics, but uh, it's only webinars. So that, that kind of brings us to our Q&A. So let's, uh, let's take a quick minute here and see what kind of questions have uh, come in. So, uh, so let me pull up our questions. Hopefully, if you have a question, you can uh, put that in. Feel free to submit that. Yeah. So let's see here. Okay, so we have a question here. Um, you mentioned UPS Returns Manager. How does that work? I've heard a little bit about it. Can you explain how I, how I implement it and what it does? So yeah, UPS Returns Manager is a UPS.com portal that any uh, UPS account number can be registered for. There's no implementation fee, which is really nice. Now, once your account number is set up on Returns Manager, then you, from an administrator perspective, set up the policy that you want it to mirror, put in the return period. So maybe you have a 60-day return window, and uh, you want the tool to operate in sync with that. So you can do did I say in sync? You did. Oh, that was another rock reference. Sorry. Um, I think that was unintentional. That was yeah. that was that. So, and and then once once everything is said, you can ask them for, hey, can you provide a reason for return? What is the weight of the return package? You can do some really dynamic things with asking the consumer why are they returning it, what condition it is. There's an open text box if you want to allow them to do that, and then they would hit go, and they would then be brought to. Um, uh, getting their return label. So we provide three methods for your consumer. Once they uh, need to make a return, they select print it now, email it somewhere else to maybe print it later, mm -hmm. 
or they can also select the new label list feature, which is called Mobile Return Label. With that, they would put in their mobile phone number, and we're going to send them a short barcode that they can bring their return package and their mobile phone into any UPS store location. And then we're going to go ahead and scan that barcode. We generate the label there, and then we're going to go ahead and accept the package, put the label on it. Very, very simple, and it doesn't require the consumer to uh, print out the label or get a label. We're going to do all that for them right there at the UPS store. And that's just done right through UPS tracking. That's what's really convenient about it. So it's consolidated. It's, it's integrated. It's integrated right into that account number. Uh, here's another good one. Uh, how can merchants prevent returns? Jim, I, uh, let me let me take a cut of that, and then you can jump in and, and help me out. So I think the first thing we need to acknowledge is is you, you can't stop returns from existing at all. Um, there's going to be some returns in the e-commerce universe. It's just part of the expectation. Right. Um, what you probably want to do is figure out how do I minimize it? How do I make it relevant and, and necessary? Uh, and, the, and the way I think we, we talked about a couple of ways you can do that. Really, it's about managing your product information page. When you're displaying those goods, making sure that, that the consumer can fully see what they're purchasing and have, have clear vision into, into what they're buying. Uh, and then making sure that the, your process is efficient, that, that we, you actually ship out what it is the person ordered. You know, I have a colleague who ordered a phone case, and uh, she, she got a phone case with a big dog picture on it. And she called up the, manu or the retailer and said, hey, I, I ordered the cat one. And uh, it's, uh, you know... How do, you, how do you avoid those kinds of mistakes? You've got to make sure you have efficient, you know, fulfillment, take back and ship operations as well. Right. Do you want to add anything on that one? Yeah, I'd love to. Um, <clears throat> additionally, a, a lot of consumer complaints are, are really there at the moment when they open the package and what they pull out didn't meet their expectations. So a lot more can be done on uh, the website. So, for instance, you can use high-definition photography, high-definition video, to really give them a, a, a clearer view of what they're looking at and, and when they do select it, when they do open it up the box, that it does match yeah, what they've got. Yep. Uh, additionally, the use of uh, demonstration videos, assembly videos, how to operate the electronic device, how to assemble the child's toy or the playground equipment. A lot of times people get frustrated Gosh darn it, they don't read the instructions on how to, but they get frustrated and they just chuck it back in the box yeah, and a, send it back. That's a great point. It's like almost everything I open these days has, with the instructions, is a big pink piece of paper that says, before returning, <laughs> call this number or go to this link, right, and, and yeah. make sure. So that's, a, that's kind of a best practice. I don't know if that will be new news to anybody, but right. definitely giving the consumer on their end the ability to prevent the return for you. And a couple of final items here, uh, what, are, what are some of the best practices out there, emerging best practices? We see a lot more being done with, especially in the uh, apparel, shoes. I even saw this with wristwatches and, and even eyeglasses. There's a lot being done with uh, apps that are built into the websites for fitting. I saw this with one of the name brand um, athletic shoe companies where you're actually taking a multiple view f photograph of your foot, mm -hmm. and they are determining what your size is and then matching you to the goods. Doing that with garments, obviously you want to see what it looks like on you. Uh, eyeglasses, same thing. You, you take a picture of your face, and that, that's put up in an AI, and then you can see the actual glasses right on your face. And then, uh, oh, we have another question here. With returns manager, do I give authorization before they start the return process? So with, uh, that's a great question. Uh, with the UPS Returns Manager platform, by virtue of you setting that up and um, putting that in place, you're authorizing that 100% of the outbound packages going out through that account number are pre-authorized for return. Now, we, we can use that platform in a little bit different way. We can get you in touch with your account manager to explain that. but. By and large, the returns manager platform is 100% of them go out and 100% of them would be authorized for, for return. Here's another question. How do I get the option of UPS driver exchange program? Is there an extra fee for this? What would the extra fee be? Yeah, so 
the bulk of the return services that we mentioned earlier are, are general service offerings. Once you get up into the premium ones, those become contracts. So your 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 account manager can come out and talk you through that and see what uh, if it's a match for what you're wanting to to uh, achieve with your returns process. Yeah, there is a additional fee on top of transportation. So in that case, you have an outbound package, you have a return package, and you have an accessorial fee in the middle to cover the driver's activities. So you got two legs of transportation plus a fee for the activity. So your uh, your sales guy can say the sales guy or gal can come out and then and coach you through that one. Here's a question. Uh, do I reach out to my UPS rep for the UPS manager portal? Exactly, yeah. So at the end of our, our webinar here, what we would like you to do is go ahead and contact your sales professional. They're certainly glad to come in and and talk through what are you trying to achieve, what are you trying to do with your returns process, your returns policy even, we'll coach you on that. And then with in, in the case of returns manager, they would they would have to do a little bit of a setup process for you. Pretty painless and no I'll cost you there. Somebody asked the question, what is an API? That is that is if you're uh, computer oriented and can do some programming, we have API specifications, application specifications. You want to design your own. We give you the minimum specifications in this case for returns that you'll need to build to so that we get the, you know proper things like the uh, the data feed coming back to UPS. The barcode that shows up on the label has to be for, formatted in a specific way. So the API specifications doc will step you through what you have to program to. So that's for folks that want to do it themselves, but we can we can coach you there too. Here's a question. How different is the return process for international shipments compared to local? Well, it is a little bit more complex for the fact that you are going across borders. Uh, in the case of, for example, uh, the United States to Germany, there's probably going to be uh, customs documentations that are involved for the outbound shipment, and that does also happen on the way back. You have to bring it back through customs to get it back here to the United States. Um, in the case of the United States, coming back into the United States, there is a, a neat thing that the government does allow a de minimis value. So I believe the current value is $800. That's right, 800 and so if the value of the goods is below $800, that, that negates that paperwork. But from a process perspective, yeah, you're still generating a label, still communicating with your consumer, and then executing a return of goods. And if it's under 800 bucks, you don't have to do the, uh, the paperwork per se. Work with your, your salesperson on that one, too. But uh, having lived internationally for seven of the last 12 years, I'll tell you that the most international shippers find that it's better to find a disposition mechanism in the destination country than to try, unless it's a high value. If you're talking about a you know, $2,000 bag or an $8,000 dress, certainly bring it back. But uh, for, for low to medium value items, you'll probably want to dispose of those in country somehow. So I think that's is that all we have time for, Jim. I think that's it. Um, just a reminder, if you need, do need more information, please go ahead and contact your UPS uh, sales professional. They're glad to come, come in and visit with you and talk about uh, UPS's returns services, technologies, and the access points network. As well as if you want further information, you can certainly visit UPS.com for details about those same things. And also as a reminder, we're going to send out a copy of this presentation to each of the attendees right after the uh, webinar is concluded. So unless you have anything else, did you get what you wanted for Christmas? And did you keep it or did you return it? Well, I kept it all. Did you get the Gene Simmons I did costume? Oh, okay. Well, I think we're all happy. So thank you very much on behalf of uh, Sean and myself. We appreciate you attending this UPS webinar related to returns. We want to make sure that you are ready to rock in 2020 with your returns and reverse logistics program. So thank you again for attending, and we'll talk to you next time.